MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. On May 11th, the national emergency and the public health emergencies will both end. What are the implications of this, both from a medical aspect and a practice of medicine aspect? Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Roger Schwelt, board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary diseases, critical care medicine, and sleep medicine, and co-founder of MedCram.com, where we explain medicine clearly. I want you to join us at MedCram.com, where we have a number of continuing education courses, including in ECG, BMP, hypertensive crisis, CBC results, vasopressors. If you ever had questions about these things, looking them up on your healthcare-related EMR, or whether you're the healthcare provider prescribed these things and looking at these results, I invite you to join us at medcram.com. So let's get down to the topic at hand. There was this Kaiser Family Foundation article, and I'll put a link to it in the description below, titled, What Happens When COVID-19 Emergency Declarations End? Implications for Coverage, Costs, and Access. I think this is a great article, and it actually goes into a lot of the detail about the cost and coverage. What I want to sort of focus on on this article is what happens to telemedicine. So telemedicine really came into its own during the pandemic. And you can imagine the reasons why, right? People didn't want to go out. They still wanted to see their healthcare providers. And so they wanted a way to do that. But the current rules and regulations just would not allow the wide use of telemedicine. So when the public health emergency was declared, there was a number of things that they could do to waive some of the restrictions to the wide use of telemedicine. And these are known as telehealth. So this is where a healthcare provider and a patient can connect with virtual connections. What were some of the things that were relaxed? We see here on the left-hand column all the things that occurred when that PHE or public health emergency was declared. Things like Medicare beneficiaries in any geographic area can receive telehealth services rather than beneficiaries living in rural only. So this was restricted primarily to rural areas, but now everyone could use it. Before, you actually had to go to a healthcare facility to connect with another healthcare provider. That was waived, and you could actually do it from the comfort of your own home. You had to use, previously, sophisticated equipment with good video, resolution, and good audio. That was waived, and you could actually do telehealth visits via your smartphone. There's also a pretty restricted list of things that would be reimbursed from Medicare. That was quickly expanded during the pandemic. We've all got a taste of this. It's going to be hard to go back because a lot of people now are kind of dependent in some ways on telehealth. They like telehealth. They want to continue to do telehealth. If there's one thing the government would not want to do is to restrict access to health care. So Congress in 2023 actually passed something called the Consolidated Appropriations Act because normally all of these things would revert back to the way they were before the PHE. 151 days after the PHE ends, which is on May 11th. But in actuality, what this law does is extend this through the end of next year, 2024. And so these things are not going away. They're actually going to stay in place even 151 days after the end of the PHE, which is May 11th. Some other things that they actually allowed during the PHE was the ability for these qualified health centers that were providing telehealth in their community to not only provide it for the community, but also other communities as well. And again, that's not going to end 151 days after the end of the PHE, but it's going to extend to the end of 2024, December 31st, 2024. And in my opinion, it's probably going to be extended even beyond that, because I don't believe between now and then we're going to have a handle on healthcare and access. There's also other aspects of this that have to do with the 50 states and their version in their state of Medicaid and their ability to do this. And in some of these states, these changes have been made already permanent. So the states are really eager to expand coverage and allow the use and reimbursement of telehealth. So this is a burgeoning area. I think this is something that's not going to be going away. In terms of cross payers, all states and DC, the District of Columbia, temporarily waive some aspects of state licensure requirements so that providers with equivalent licenses in other states could actually practice via telehealth. That means that if there's somebody in California who's a healthcare provider and they're treating somebody in New York, 
New York would say, okay, we don't mind that the healthcare provider is operating under a license in a different state. So you have to understand here in the United States, you can only practice medicine in a state that you're licensed for. Most physicians and healthcare providers are only licensed in their state that they practice in. Some of them actually have dual appointments depending on where they travel to. So what happens? Here it says, it depends. There's some states that have made that waiver permanent. They have the ability to do that. They don't need a federal law to be passed because it's their own law. And if they said, you know what, if you're doing telemedicine, you're from a different state, we'll allow that because we want our state population to have as best access to care as possible. There are some that are probably going to let them expire because they are very protective of their licensure in their states. And some states may extend it. So you've got to look up in your state. That'll tell you what's going to happen. There's some other waivers that happen. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, we didn't have a lot of technology in place for telemedicine. We were using things like FaceTime and Skype, and you have to realize that these things are not HIPAA compliant. They don't have the encryption level that you would need to have for it to be HIPAA compliant. But the law kind of winked at this at first. That's not going to be winked at anymore after May 11th. On May 11th, at the end of PHE, they will not be waiving potential penalties for HIPAA violations against healthcare providers that serve patients in good faith through everyday communication technologies. And you can see that they probably have realized that it's about time that you have the appropriate telecommunications in place that would be HIPAA compliant by this point. And then the DEA, so that is federal, right? So if you want to prescribe a controlled substance like a narcotic to somebody who has pain, that is a controlled substance and therefore is controlled by the DEA. And there was a waiver that would allow you to be able to prescribe certain substances that are controlled across state lines doing telemedicine. And that is also going to expire on May 11th at the end of PHE, unless of course the DEA specifies an earlier date. There's a lot of other different things that have to do with Medicaid and flexibilities and Medicare payments and even private insurance flexibilities as well that you can read here. And again, we'll leave a link in the description below so you can see very clearly what is going to be continued and what is not. The point, though, that I want to make here is that telehealth is here to stay in some form or another. So that may be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. A good thing, of course, is that telehealth is a service that's going to reach people that would not normally be coming in to see the doctor. I have patients that don't want to come in. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be in the waiting room. They don't want to catch the virus that somebody else might have. And these are all legitimate concerns, especially for patients that are immunocompromised. So getting a telehealth visit is a godsend for them. And you're going to reach people that you would not normally be able to reach. So I think definitely from that standpoint, telehealth and its expansion, and it looks as though its continuation is going to be a good thing. On the other hand, it could be a bad thing if it's not watched carefully. So what I mean by that is that there are some patients that I really would want to make sure are actually being seen and physically examined by healthcare providers. I can tell you that personally myself, I've seen patients that have come in for one particular issue, like either sleep medicine or pulmonary, but I've picked up something completely different that I would never have been able to pick up if it was a telehealth visit. I can't examine them. There's certain subconscious cues that you can see when somebody comes into your office that you might not see on a telehealth visit, for instance, how they're walking. You might pick up some physical exam findings that way. I once had a patient that came in that was not walking very well. Because of that, I was able to dig down a little bit deeper, find out that this is relatively acute, new. He was having back pain, he was having fevers, and we sent him immediately to the emergency room where an MRI revealed that he had an epidural abscess in his spine that was an infection. And if it hadn't been treated and caught, it could have cost him his ability to walk permanently. And so we were able to see that, even though that had nothing to do with why he was there. So that's just one example. There's so many other examples that I could give you potentially where a physician, nurse practitioner, a PA, putting their hands on a patient and examining them can actually give you a lot of information. So I hope that telehealth is not used as a substitute for patients going into seeing their healthcare providers, but is used as a way of extending care. I think if that's the case, telehealth is going to be very, very helpful, and it's going to allow us to extend to patients that would not normally have that ability. I think some of the good aspects of the PHE that was declared are going to be continued, and some of the things that were kind of winked at or allowed to go through are going to be kind of wrapped up here on May 11th. So I hope that was helpful for a lot of you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please turn on notifications and leave a comment below about how telehealth has affected your practice, both from the healthcare provider side and from the patient side. Thanks for joining us.